tonight. So I'm <laughs> that's why. So that's my title is the politics of the transition to digital televi terrestrial television in Italy. And I will use uh, um, uh, Italy as a case study. So in this presentation, I'm going to uh, talk to you about the digital transition in the television sector in Italy. And uh, I'm going spe specifically to look at the political motivations behind uh, this transition, pointing out that at least in the case of Italy, the tra uh, transition to digital terrestrial television is being dictated by governments and industrial interests um, not certainly driven by citizens' needs or desires or interests. Um, the opportunity to look at the transition to digital terrestrial um, television is, uh, I think, important. Um, also, from because it gives uh, gives us uh, the um, a window to look at the role of national broadcasting legislations and study the influence of national broadcasting histories and cultures in the face of global and regional forces. In this presentation, I am going to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to introduce digital terrestrial television, I'll call it DTT. And then I will discuss some of the general motivations for this transition. And then uh, I will focus on uh, the case of Italy. So what is the digital transition? Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me explain what digital terrestrial television, or DTT, is. It's a technology that uses the frequency currently used uh, by analog broadcasters to deliver digital signal. The space uh, that is currently used uh, to just broadcast one channel um, is, uh, will now be used to bro broadcast up to four digital channels, so much more efficient. The digital transition implies also the switch off, of course, of the analog broadcasting signal. And uh, you are probably all right familiar with that transition here because uh, is, uh, uh, many countries are going through the, that transition and the United States is next. February 17th, 2009 is the date uh, when uh, the digital, the analog uh, um, uh, signal is going to switch off. And according to some estimates that I looked at, as of October 2008, um, six to seven million households, uh, analog, only analog households in the US, are at risk of going blank on the day of the switch off. So why digital terrestrial television of all possible technologies that could have been used uh, for um, digital delivery, why this particular technology well, um, and why, of course, the governments uh, in various different countries have been so prone, so eager to support this particular technology. Everybody will tell you that, uh, that of course, DTT is cheap <laughs> and user-friendly technology. You only need uh, a decoder or a setup box, um, and you can still use your old uh, TV set. But there are other reasons behind this, and that's what we are going to look at, at those other reasons. Um, one reason is, uh, um, well, first of all, we need to realize that the momentum for the shift uh, to digital television, and then, uh, as it is happening now, digital terrestrial television started already in the 90s. And, um, uh, the political or ideological reasons that I wanted to uh, introduce to you now started at that time. During the 90s, much attention was being devoted to supporting the so-called information revolution and information society. The DTT technology, which, was, which is the only able to provide free to air digital content, was seen as part of the various governments' plan to bring uh, consumers and citizens onto what then uh, uh, Vice President Al Gore even called as the information superhighway. We find that those similar motivations behind uh, uh, many other governments' decisions to choose this, this particular technology. One other important reason, of course, has to do with resources, with uh, the radio spectrum that became scarce 
following the explosive growth of wireless telephony and other telecommunication services. The spe spectrum bandwidth, which is granted through licenses by the governments to broadcasters following different methodologies, dif different governments do that in different ways, had become already by the mid-1990s hot prime real estate. According to estimates, the U.S. government will make about $12 billion just out of auctioning a small part of the radio spe spectrum that is being released by the broadcasters as part of the transition in this country. And uh, freed up bandwidth that will also be used uh, for civil services and of course for commercial purposes. Now let's move to Europe because uh, 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 that's what I wanted to give you is uh, context uh, and now uh, the context we, we focus it into the European situation and then more specifically into the Italian situation. Well, in Europe we have a different mindset. As a famous chairman of uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation said uh, once in the 1950s, a different attitude when it comes to television. Broadcasting is a specially political, is a spe specially, spe specially, Political, uh, politically sensitive sector. Television is still seen as a fundamental medium to foster more cohesive societies, more participation, more representation, and overall better the quality of our democracies. In fact, because of how touchy the topic of television, broadcasting television is, and how strong national uh, broadcasting and uh, um, uh, broadcasting interests are that even the European Union has only made uh, timid attempts to regulate broadcasting and uh, specifically when it comes to introduce digital terrestrial television. But if we wa were to read through the government's uh, policy papers that um, sustain uh, or support, introduce uh, introduced the digital terrestrial television in a variety of uh, European countries, we would find uh, two main reasons again. One is very similar to the overall reasons that I talked to you about, the political ideological reasons that I was mentioning, right? Bridge the digital divide. Bring everybody on. Uh, let everybody enjoy and share um, the riches of uh, digital technologies and digital television. This was redefined uh, uh, once more at the Lisboa European Uni uh, Union Summit of 2000. Bridge the digital divide. Digital te te uh, terrestrial television was going to be one very crucial technology that was going to do that. Everybody has a TV set, right? So uh, this would be the cheap way to get everybody on board. And then the second reason was to provide a natural continuation for generalist, naming, uh, uh, namely non-thematic, uh, free-to-air, analog terrestrial television broadcasters. And of course, you have to realize that we are in Europe and there are lots of public service broadcasters there, and uh, um, DTT was seen as a continuation of that, uh, of, of those generalist uh, broadcasters. Now I'm going to, no, that's not where I want to be. Okay, guys, you have to be, okay. So, um, Let's go through the various elements of this transition, and in particular, I have my little laser here, the little timeline for the transition to digital terrestrial television in Europe. As we can see, um, can you all see? Yeah. Um, different countries have a different timeline. Uh, the uh, United Kingdom is the leading country. Uh, leading this transition, really. Um, they had a bill fallout in the 19, uh, late 1990s. In uh, October 2002, the UK launches Freeview, with the British Broadcasting Corporation leading, really, 
um, uh, the, the, their free to air digital terrestrial platform with the British, uh, with the BBC uh, leading. They are supposed to complete the transition in uh, 2012. Um, Italy, uh, of course, is going to be our case study. I'll talk more about it, but started officially the uh, transmission of digital television in uh, December of three, and um, oh, well, as it happened also here, the digital, the analog switch off was foreseen first uh, to be happening in 2006, then it moved to 2008, and now finally it is set for 2012. Very interesting, I think, is the case of Germany as well, which um, completes its uh, digital transition uh, regions by region by region. And in only less than uh, one year, um, those guys switched the whole area of Berlin into all digital. If anybody has questions through you know, the presentation, please fr feel free to Stop. Yes. So by your timeline, does this mean that none of these European nations have switched off analog? Right. Exactly. Right. right. Mm -hmm. There are regions, though, that might be all digital already, like Berlin or, as we would talk about, certain regions in Italy. Different countries have used, adopted different transition strategies. And we'll talk about Italy more. But yes, that's what it means, Beth, is that when we talk about switch off, is that's the that day, the, um, the deadline by which all analog signal will, be, will go blank, like uh, February 17th, um, next February here in this country. Uh, in many European countries, it's going to happen around, see, the, the, soon, uh, the soonest, is got soonest, the soonest, whatever, 2010, uh, 2011, 2012. That's a good question, thanks. Okay. Hello? I am. Something here, thank you. <laughs> okay, I couldn't find a political map, map of Europe. Can you believe that? Anyway, uh, that's my map of, uh, um, of uh, Western Europe, and the reason why you know I'm concentrating there is uh, uh, in for this particular presentation is that it represents the biggest uh, uh, four or five of the biggest markets, television markets in Europe. There are 168 million TV households. And as you can see, I'm sorry, guys, I'm uh, getting uh, uh, better here but <laughs> with all this technology. But by June 2008, um, digital television in general is, uh, uh, is you know, is, is uh, picking up uh, more than a half percent of uh, all those households have uh, migrated to digital. And of that 57%, about 29% is digital terrestrial television. Now, historically, if I could show you um, a, a trend here, we would see that um, my, uh, digital terrestrial television is indeed picking up. So it's, it's doing well. Woo. Yeah, and I don't need that. Okay, great. Well, what did you say? Oh, you're just moving that. Okay, Italy. I didn't want this to come up, really. Where is it? Here. Okay, so Italy as a case study. So now, why do I choose Italy <coughs> as a case study? Well, there are uh, a couple of reasons. Um, well, more. Um, there are some serious and some less serious reasons. The um, less serious reasons are that if I had to go anywhere in the world, why would I not go to Italy? I got some money for doing this, you know. I got some grants and some funds. So of all places, why not Italy? The other reason is that they happen to speak Italian and that's my mother tongue. So that's very good when you <laughs> have to go around and do interviews, which is also what I did for this research. I did archival research. 
um, of uh, uh, policy documents. I analyze policy, policy do documents. I understand that might sound really boring, but I also interviewed a bunch of people, and that is the fun part of the research. I hope I'm going to have an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about that. But then there are some serious reasons. Uh, why Italy is such an interesting case study. We talked about how important television is in Europe and how politically sensitive it is. Well, if it is in Europe, even more so in Italy. Uh, the Italian media system and television system in particular has been defined by Giuseppe Riccari, a famous uh, um, European scholar, as one of the most complex in the European context for the set of interrelationships among political, sociocultural, and economic variables. Indeed, Italy is uh, one of the Western democracies with the highest level of media concentration. In particular, that is true in its television market, defined as a duopoly, which is controlled by two major players, RAI, Radio Audizioni Italiane, and that is the Italian public service broadcaster, and then Mediaset, the commercial competitor. Now, the guy you see there is uh, this person here, is, uh, he's Silvio Berlusconi. He's uh, our, for the first time, uh, uh, Prime Minister of Italy. And also, he is the, uh, the owner of the majority of Mediaset, the commercial competitor, the commercial duopolis in the broadcasting market. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Um, what do we nee mean uh, when we talk about uh, a duopoly? Uh, well, it's concentration of the market. How we, uh, how, how, um, how we calculate that concentration? Well, in various ways. Uh, for instance, concentration of uh, uh, frequencies. There are 10 national broadcasting channels in Italy. Mediaset has three of those 10 national channels. RAI has another three of those national broadcasting channels. Other broadcasters, small broadcasters, including Telecom Italia, La Sette, have the remaining uh, frequencies. So already there you see there is a concentration. Certainly um, these two channels occupy, these two broadcasters occupy um, about, you know, a lot of the uh, national available analog frequencies, right? And then here we see the concentration of advertising revenues. In the year 2007, Mediaset controlled about seven, uh, 60 to 60% 60 of uh, national advertising revenues for TV, whereas Rai accessed uh, 30 to 35% of those um, revenues. Again, the others, just the remaining, um, the remaining. Audience share um, is also very concentrated. Uh, the two of them together, Rai and Mediaset, I don't have those uh, numbers um, on, uh, on the slide, but, but audience share is also very concentrated. I, at the end of 2007, Mediaset controlled 40 percent of national audience share, RAI controlled 45 percent of national audience share. So the two of them, RAI and Mediaset, uh, really control uh, advertising revenues. They um, uh, command so much in terms of national audiences and, of course, uh, occupy a lot of those uh, frequencies. Italy is also a country whose uh, media system has been heavily influenced by the political system. And here, uh, you know, I want to talk about Silvio Berlusconi, and this is the image of the Italian Senate. The apex of that relationship, that has been a historical, uh, long relationship between the political, the television system, and uh, um, the, um, the party system, is embodied by Silvio Berlusconi. Um, who has been able to use uh, his uh, economic clout as a switch to immediately cover convert media power into public influence. I'm just quoting here from Jürgen Habermas, a recent publication on uh, uh, talking about Italy in particular. Um, now, 
the fact that we have uh, a media mogul turned politician has really throughout the decades worth the debate on media related issues as you can imagine and so broadcasting especially you know uh, policies for television has always been slow to come and when it would come we always favor uh, the duopolists and at times openly favor actually Mediaset. Whoops, I didn't want to do that, and indeed I didn't do that. Good. So, um, some of those who uh, welcome new telecommunication technologies as um, Am I going to do it? No? Okay, just, oh no, this is probably. Okay, guys, just pretend it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those uh, who welcome new uh, the communication technologies as revolutionary say that, uh, quote, each new advance in the technology of communication delivery disturbs a status quo. I'm quoting actually from E.T.L. de Sola Puo, very famous sociologist and from a very famous textbook of, uh, um, uh, uh, called uh, Technologies of Freedom. Well, in the rest of this presentation, I want to show to you how much the legislation surrounding the transition to digital terrestrial television and the public discourse on this topic in Italy has been warped by the uh, inherent anomaly embodied by Prime, Prime Minister Berlusconi and his conflict of interest. Um, so in Italy, the transition to digital terrestrial television is not disturbing the status quo. Actually, what I want to show you um, now is doing quite the contrary. It has been pushed by governments, various Italian governments, starting in the late 1990s by the center-left government at that time, with the intent to preserve and protract for as long as possible the duopoly, and by doing that, protracting that duopoly, favoring the incumbents, and in particular media, media set, in the future full digital TV media environment. Okay, so here I go through my policy documents, right? And uh, I'm going, uh, you know, that could be uh, extremely overwhelming. So <laughs> uh, this is my graphic, I hope that helps. Um, it starts in 1997 uh, with the law. Well, here, what I'm, I'm doing here is I'm going to give you a timeline um, and ex try to explain to you, extrapolate um, from it, the significance of the introduction of DTT and how that was used to preserve and protect uh, the duopoly, right? That's what I'm trying to do. So I'm not going to go through the whole broadcasting uh, policy, uh, the history of it, but just the most significant. I told you that the center-left government in the late 1990s, just right at the time when uh, even in the UK, in the US, everybody was talking about how important it was to move the consumer's electronic sector and uh, um, find uh, new technologies and how important DTT was going to be. Well, also the Italian government really wanted to be on top of this digital revolution, wanted to show how much Italy was really going to be uh, technologically advanced. In 1997, um, a antitrust limit was set in place in an attempt to reduce the duopoly that I was talking to you about. So they said nobody can own more than 20% of national channels. Remember we saw that pie that says that Rai and Mediaset both own <laughs> certainly more than 20%, about 30% of national channels. That is now, well already in 1997, probably before, uh, but certainly by this time, the legislator is saying, okay, this is it, and, you know, this duopoly cannot go any farther. Let's set that 20% of national channels. And did nothing else. They just said, you know, that's the antitrust uh, limit. In uh, 1999, there is a maxi amendment, a new regulation that 
says that Italy is going to be at the forefront of digital terrestrial television. The UK is doing it, other countries are doing it, any Spain is doing it. We, we are going to do it too. And actually we are going to get it done by 2006. By 2006 the whole uh, country, as Beth was saying, was going to um, turn off its analog um, signal and the whole country would become digital. Um, so, you know, start thinking there is going to be lots of plenty, much more channels. Those limitations, those antitrust limitations that just were set up, well, let's see about those. I mean, 2006 is close. In only seven years, we are going to really have a revolution here and spectrum scarcity won't be a problem anymore. Um, in 2001 and 2002, two very important pieces of legislation, one ruling and sentences, one from the AGCOM, that's the uh, authority for the uh, communication in Italy, and the other one uh, from the Constitutional Court. In 2000, the first uh, in 2001 and the other one in 2002 say, that law, you know, that previous law, this, this law here, Okay, 1997, that sets the antitrust limitation to 20%, has a very deep flaw. It doesn't say what to do with the exceeding channels. RAI has three channels, Mediaset has three channels. What are we going to do with those, you know, the third channel that is obviously exceeding that 20%? Well, they say those, each channel, you know, uh, so each broadcaster, Rai and Mediaset will have to send, migrate one of their free channels to a digital platform at that point. Could have been digital terrestrial television. Now that sent, how do you say, spikes through the core, the sp I don't know how you say, but uh, you know, I mean, that was quite of something. Uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi had become Prime Minister again in May of 2001 and uh, do you think he was going and his government were going to let this go and get one of their uh, channels in particular it had been Rete Quattro, one of its uh, three channels that makes lots of money, lots of revenues, advertising etc. go like that, that was not going to happen and indeed in 2000, at the end of 2003, for the second um, time in Italian history, I can't go through the first time, but for the second time in Italian history, the government passes a decree, um, a decree that says at the end of 2003, and says the law that, you know, these constitutional court sentences uh, um, that say this, these channels have to go to satellite or to digital, no. Um, we now are, um, we need a decree to save, it was actually called the Save Rete Quattro de Decree. We need to put out a decree and keep these channels on the air. We'll talk about, you know, how they got around to do that, but I want you to make sure uh, you know that. In May 2004, a very controversial law is passed. It's called the Gasparri Law. Um, these laws are named after the names of the uh, communication ministers at that time. We are still under a center-left government led by Silvio Berlusconi. And uh, the Gasparri Law redefines the antitrust limitations. It says, okay, it's 20%, but now we're going to talk about advertising revenues and it's not going to be just TV. It's going to be the whole media market, the internet, book, print, um, the cinema, everything. So 20% out of that much bigger basket at this point. <coughs> Ryan Media said neither of them was at this point in breach of antitrust legislations with this new law. Also, in two, uh, I think it was in 2005, 
once I realized, hey, I mean, we pushed this DTT so much, we were going to think it's going to happen by the end of 2006. It's obviously not going to happen, but wait, it's going to happen soon. Postponed to 2008. In 2006, the European Union, and the European Commissioner for Competition, rules against the law, the Gasparri law, and in particular, uh, the European Commission says the law contains unjustified restrictions for new operators and unjustified advantage for the existing ones. And uh, the danger being, uh, according to Cross, uh, Neil Cross, the European Commissioner, that the law could in fact preclude those who are not active in the analog broadcasting market from experimenting with the creation of digital transmission and digital networks. That's exactly what was happening, uh, by pro and especially by prolonging the transitional period, you make it easier for the incumbents to gather the frequencies that they need, the money that they need, the kind of content that they need at the, expensive, uh, at the expenses of any new um, operator. We got a new government, which unfortunately fa fell like, um, uh, after only 20 months, um, and that's a center-left government, and the uh, minister of that government, the communication mi minister, and in general the government, has the reform of the media sector, including television and including public service broadcasting, high on its agenda. So they pass a bill that a reform law that, however, made it through the government, of course, was uh, sanctioned by the government, but never made it through the parliament or the House of Deputies. That bill says uh, those owning more than two national channels must send exceeding channels to digital platforms. Okay, so now they're trying to be very much more precise. A new antitrust ceiling is set of 45% of all advertising revenues in the, only in the TV market, that is going to be um, the antitrust limitation now, 45%. Think that Rai and Mediaset, when we saw it at one of the first slides, all together, 60 plus 30, they control about 90% of the money of advertising resources for the television industry. This law, was going to bring that down to 45, to a cap of 45%. The law never go, go anywhere, and uh, there is another postponement to 2012, and right now that's the time when uh, um, the transition is going to happen. Um, February 2008, the European Court of Justice rules against Italy, the Italian government, because uh, get this, um, Euro uh, in all this history of allocating frequencies, uh, um, there was one broadcaster, actually that broadcaster is uh, from a, a hometown, a town close to mine in the center of Italy, and uh, the name of this uh, broadcasting um, was Euro Europa Sette. They have been granted licenses to broadcast um, and, uh, you know, th uh, they had been assigned frequencies in 1999, but since then had never been able to use those frequencies because those fr frequencies were occupied by whom? Mediaset and in particular Rete 4. Well, actually, uh, those frequencies that had been uh, formally assigned in 1999 to Europa 7 uh, really uh, are <laughs> occupied illegally by Rete 4. So the European Court of Justice rules against Italy. Um, the new Berlusconi government, because unfortunately in May, in uh, April 2008, um, after the fall of uh, the center-left government, we have a new government now, and Silvio Berlusconi is again the prime minister for the third time in Italian history. And this new Berlusconi government passes what? The third <laughs> em emergency decree to spare, once again, Rete 4 from going anywhere. This time, fortunately, the Senate votes it down. What is going to happen to Rete 4? What do you think, guys? 
Um, somebody now is saying, uh, well, it finally will go to digital. Well, yeah, sooner or later, everybody's going to go to digital, right? Um, and it's going to happen by the end of 2009. I doubt it. And so, let's see if I can go to my next slide. Okay, so um, this guy here is uh, Fedele Confalonieri. He is the president of Mediaset. He's a personal friend of Silvio Berlusconi. How can I say? He's a uh, big shot, right? Um, I was invited during my field trip in Italy to go to a conference that was not an academic conference. And uh, I was invited to go there and uh, I had a very good networking person. And he told me, come to this conference. There will be all these big shots there. But if you want an interview with them, don't say this to any of your methodology professors, but um, because you're not supposed not to reveal your true identity with your subjects when you interview them. But do not say you are an academic, because if you do, nobody will want to talk to you. Just pretend you're part of the press corp. So here it was. I was just part of the press corp, and so I was into this big, uh, you know, this room, and there was a couch, and I sat down, and Fidele Confalonieri just came uh, into the room with a bunch of people, and he, he was right there. I had my little tape recorder, and so among all these other uh, journalists, I asked him a question, and uh, it's going to be straight into uh, Italian, but it's going to just, just a few seconds. Presidente, che succede a Rete 4? Ma che succede niente, però che continui ad andare avanti così. Fino al 2012. Fino al 2012. La legge prevede che di mandarla sul digitale terrestre prima. Allora io spero che questa legge non passi. Ha! Okay, well, okay, hold on. No, we, we have to go back there. Uh, so I asked him, uh, anybody speaks Italian? I asked him, so Presidente, you know, President of Mediaset, I said, uh, so what is happening with Rete 4? He says, nothing. <laughs> uh, I say, well, is it not going to go to digital television? Oh, well, at one point in 2012, I said, but there is a proposed bill. Um, and this was a year ago, so the bill was still uh, on the floor. He said, oh, that's a bad law, and uh, I hope won't pass. In fact, it didn't. So um, now I want to go into just the offer of DTT. So DTT was uh, promoted as provided quality TV, free to air TV, right, to everybody. This was going to be the way in which we were going to all join the digital world, uh, and that would be the continuation of national broadcasters. So. Let's look at the actual content and let's look into how the offer uh, changes. Now, naturally, digital television platforms tend to produce a polarized market, whereas valuable content, in particular first released films and popular sports events, gravitate towards pay channels. This is my pay content. And then, uh, um, whereas um, uh, programs of lower quality produced uh, with small budgets, not all the times, this is a symptom of lower co quality, of course, but programs of lower qu quality in general tend to migrate to the free to air DTT uh, platforms. So these are my, the blue ones, or whatever that color is, is my free to air DTT, the yellowish RP satellite. I just want you to know this bunch of generalist channels. Some of them are the basic analog generalist channels, but some of them are just, um, um, I mean, channels I've never heard about. Uh, they might not contain even anything in them. I'm very few programming. Uh, kids television, I think that's really a key there, there is only, well, up until January 2007, there was only one channel for children. I actually, guess who produced that, put it out? Mediaset, not the public service broadcaster. Um, the, since then, uh, since January 2007, the public service broadcaster has put out a children um, DTT, digital 
uh, channel for digital terrestrial television. The point is nobody watches it, which you know I think is quite um, important. Um, so now, so that's, that's the kind of gap that is happening. And I think if you consider television, if you believe that television is important for social cohesion, that is important to promote democracy, and uh, you know, um, that is something more than simple, d d just an industry, and has to make money, then you see how this uh, diverse, uh, polarization of the offer might be problematic. Now, uh, what it has been happening, however, something new in the last year, and in this uh, de uh, media set has been really at the forefront. See, they really had the time to get ready for this, and by the time digital terrestrial television, uh, the analog signal would be shut down, my point, you know, a, a major uh, thing is that media set uh, is really going to be the, the one that is better uh, situated. So what they are doing is, uh, instead of free to air DTT, they have been experimenting with uh, um, premium and pay DTT, which is unique. It's really, uh, I don't know of anybody else who is doing this, and it's working very well. I mean, look at the revenues that they are getting. The premium DTT, premium media set um, offer started, was launched in 2005 uh, with 44 million euros. And look how much it has improved. Now in particular, I think one pr very particular important thing is what is happening to soccer. Um, um, Following a trend that began in 2004, soccer on free-to-air TV is now all gone. It was moved, it slowly went from free-to-air to free DTT as an attempt to, you know, make that market go. Um, and now is completely gone, even from free-to-air DTT channels. Um, the only way you are going to see Serie A or the... Uh, how do you call it? The, um, the uh, Serie A. You know, the best uh, leagues, uh, um, soccer uh, matches, is only going to be on this kind of uh, pay DTT uh, channels, media set channels, and of course on Sky Italia, which is the sole operator in the uh, TV satellite uh, sector in Italy. Not only full matches are off site for those who cannot afford them. Popular shows like Domenica Sportiva or Tutto il Calcio Minuto per Minuto, these are very popular sports that were watched uh, every Sunday um, on uh, free to air TV, uh, do not have the rights anymore to broadcast even the goals, you know, the, 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 those few seconds of uh, goals. Only three minutes of images, according to the last. Um, uh, you know, rights, uh, uh, broadcasting rights um, agreements. Only three minutes of images during news bulletins and goals can be broadcast or, uh, yeah, only in the evening news on Sunday. So soccer is gone. Serie B, the next um, league, will be on La Sette, Carta Più, another uh, premium. Uh, um, Per, uh, per, uh, you know, uh, pay services on DTT. Uh, La Sette is owned by Telecom Italia. So what used to be available for all and for free, and that was, uh, you know, in this particular case, soccer is not anymore. So what is the role of public service broadcasting in all this? I mean, the role is crucial, or should be crucial, should be to reverse and oppose this trend, to offer a space for quality, fruity, free to air TV and, uh, uh, and, and so let's, let's see if that is what is happening. Um, during that conference that I told you about, I, when I interviewed Fedele Confalonieri, I also got to interview the Minister of Communication in the same way, right? So this is Paolo Gentiloni. This is the site of the conference and uh, this is a little bit um, 
of the interview, if I can get to it. And in this interview, uh, you know, little uh, soundbite, I'm asking you, I'm asking him, what is the role of public service broadcasting in all this? Ha, I didn't do it. Okay, I'm going to try again. sono quelle di una televisione per tutti, di una televisione gratuita e di una televisione di qualità. So what he's saying is that uh, um, this is going to be a television uh, for everybody and a television of quality and a television uh, uh, free for all. Now is that true? The offer of Rai is very limited. Um, during one of the most serious interviews, not these ones, you know, the uh, sound bites that I did under, you know, the guise of uh, a reporter, um, when I interviewed uh, um, some uh, top level officials in uh, the public broadcaster, uh, what they told me, sorry. So what they told me was that uh, uh, the role of public service broadcasting is, re is being redefined. And uh, he said that there is now a new perimeter. Look, he didn't use the word a new vision or a new horizon, a new perimeter, very limited. And there are three elements to that perimeter, kids, children television, sports, there are sports channels on DTT, one sports channel on DTT, and then uh, there are all news uh, channel on DTT. The children's channel I told you about is there, something is there, nobody really watches it. Uh, sports channel, guess what they have on that, on that sport channel? Anybody wants to guess? Well, Formula Uno would be a great sport, uh, would be awesome. No, you can't broadcast that kind of stuff on free to air, right? Because too much, costs too much, too popular, the, 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 you know. Secondary, very marginal sports, cross country skiing. <laughs> calcetto, I don't know among you who is, a, a, calcetto is when uh, five guys and five guys or girls or whatever, you know, they play one against the other in a very small uh, um, soccer field. Many people uh, like to, how do you call it? Okay, well, nobody watches it. They play it, but it's really not one of those sports that, you know, you might really want to watch. And then hockey, and I don't know what you think about hockey, but certainly in Italy it's not a big thing. So the sports um, element is really insignificant. Uh, and then the Rai News uh, 24 News Channel was a great channel. It was uh, founded uh, in 1998. It was uh, a channel that actually was founded for the uh, satellite and then now is on DTT. Um, I spoke with many journalists uh, who work for Rai News 24, and they are appalled. There is so little money, the infrastructures are left to what it was at the end of 1990s, and if people, Italians, are going to watch any big national event, are they going to watch it on Rai News 24 or Sky Italia News? They're going to watch it on Sky Italia News, those who can. Okay, so that's a very bleak uh, panorama here for you, but um, let me give you my conclusions. The true digital divide lies in content, not technical delivery technologies. More government support is necessary, during the, the, especially during the transitional phase, to encourage the production and delivery of quality free-to-wear content for digital terrestrial television. The polarized TV market that I talked to you about is very <laughs> problematic. Pluralism of information, the fact of having more channels does not automatically, uh, is not, I'm sorry, pluralism of information is not an automatic consequence of technological progress. And lawmakers ma should work on new public policies to guide, rather than simply describing 
technological transformations and what is happening in the TV market. Um, the push to DTT has not been dictated by a concern to increase pluralism and provide new services because that's clearly not the case. And so while it is the case that DTT is proving to be a valuable and competitive technology for delivery of digital signals, it is also true that it's being used to deliver high quality pay TV rather than serving to benefit the have-nots. Mediaset, once more in the history of the Italian broadcasting and television, is emerging as the winner of this Italian anomaly. Thank you. This is all.